present moment and smile. Just relax. You have nothing to do and nowhere to go. Dear respected Thai, dear siblings, dear practitioners, today is the 29th of June and we are studying the 34th tenet of Plum Village practice. This is on <clears throat> store consciousness. And in Sanskrit, Alaya Vishnana. Consciousness, alaya, is a store, like Himalaya, the store of snow. <laughs> or usually, I think in America, we say Himalaya, right? In India, they say Himalaya. <coughs> Alaya is a, the storehouse of Himalaya, storehouse of snow. This is a, the consciousness which stores. <coughs> Store consciousness is able to learn make habits archive
organize, organize strategies. to face situations. And to protect. Nourish. Heal and continue life. It's its function. is to establish a database. <laughs> of unconscious habits. Establish a database of unconscious habits of responding to situations. Which make it possible for a human being to be on autopilot. So, in psychology, the study of consciousness, we can talk about sometimes uh, background consciousness, foreground consciousness. Sometimes we say the unconscious and the conscious. So we use different words to describe what in, in Buddhist psychology is called store consciousness. So we have... Um, say we have our present moment consciousness um, that is the awareness of what's going on in our mind in the present moment we call mind consciousness MC <laughs> and then but 
underneath we have this store consciousness, which is always taking in information from mind consciousness as well as the six, the, the sense other sense organs. So we have the eye, the ear, nose, tongue, body. And these senses, like the eye receiving sights, the ear receiving sound, the nose receiving smells, tongue, taste, and body, sens touch, sensation, they're all penetrating through our sense organs into mind consciousness. And then mind consciousness then mm, <clears throat> It can be aware of what we're seeing, what we're hearing, and so forth. And that awareness, uh, and e even when we're not necessarily aware of mind consciousness, these impressions can go into store consciousness. So it means they're no longer present in our mind. For example, if I say to take a moment, close your eyes, and imagine a candle. So you bring to mind the image of a candle. You're not seeing a candle. Your eyes are closed. But there's something like a candle, like the image, the visual image of a candle. And then you can also, uh, let's say you can imagine the sound of a, of a match being struck to light the candle. You're not hearing the striking of a match, but you can imagine in your mind consciousness the sound of a match being struck and the flame burning into the sulfur, into flame. And uh, similarly, we can imagine the, the smell of maybe the, the burning match, the smell of sulfur, heat, or the smell of a candle with the wax. We can imagine it, there's something like it in mind consciousness. Maybe we don't taste the candle. <laughs> but you probably, at some time, maybe when you were a kid, you had some wax in your mouth and you have something like what it might taste like. Have a little bit of wax. And then, of course, there's a sensation of the wax on your hand, maybe the heat from the candle. Or if you've ever you know, poured some wax on your hand when you're holding a candle, we have the, a database of sensations. Okay, we can open our eyes. So where did all of those images come from? They're not coming from our senses, right? So the store consciousness is as the function of storing all kinds of sensations, um, tendencies, uh, the seeds of all kinds of our emotions. And mind consciousness can bring up those sensations. So we can, for example, uh, even we're not seeing the candle, but we can maintain in our mind consciousness the image of a candle. And that image of a candle is stored in store consciousness. And it may be that the image that we have is not like any one particular candle. <laughs> like, it's kind of funny that when I myself practice bringing up the image of a candle, I imagine a candle which is on a, a kind of holder with a little round metal thing for putting your finger in and holding it. But actually, I didn't have candles like that. That's more like an idealized image of a candle from a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago that I saw in books. So it's actually an image, a representation of a candle. <laughs> and I, I have candle, I have a candle in my room, which I light sometimes in the morning, but I didn't imagine that candle. I think I thought of an idealized image 
of the candle that I'd seen in a book. <laughs> so, so somehow in my past experience, I had this, uh, I saw this image of a candle and then something like it and I couldn't, was, um, came up in my consciousness when I said the word candle and I practiced to imagine what a candle looks like comes up right away without almost any effort. So store consciousness has the quality of um, learning. Archiving. So somehow it had archived that image. So it, long ago that image of a candle had come in. I'd seen the, the picture of a candle on a page in this in this case, and then just without having to make any effort, store consciousness archived it until this moment when I say the word candle and I bring up the image. So store consciousness is always operating, even when we're sleeping. It uh, for example, when we recall a dream, um, when we wake up in the morning, we've been having a dream. And that dream is coming from all kinds of things that have been archived in sore consciousness. <laughs> and then we try to recall the details of that dream. And sometimes we can recall many details. I, I notice that often I can only recall the very last things that happened in the dream. <laughs> Even though I have the, the experience of having gone through something quite vivid and quite lengthy, but I can have a lot of difficulty to remember the, the earlier parts that led up to the very end, which was right before I woke up. So I don't know about you, but that's, that often happens to me. So sometimes I, have, I can remember the entire dream, but, some, but more often it's just the last little, when I actually try to with mind consciousness, look at what happened in the dream. I only see the, the last little bits. <laughs> and sometimes I write it down just to try to understand the way in which store consciousness has been storing and archiving these other experiences. And that somehow when, my, when I am relaxed in um, the rapid eye movement, portion of sleeping that suddenly this, it stimulates somehow. Mind consciousness uh, of while I'm sleeping stimulates store consciousness and brings up these images and creates this whole story. Sometimes a totally creative story that I, I don't know where it came from, <laughs> but somehow it's in the dream like that. So mind consciousness is when we wake up and we try to recall the details of the dream, it has to go back down and store consciousness and see what has been stored there. Because as we are dreaming, it is like a lived experience. And store consciousness archives the dream <laughs> and proceeds to organize it. How many of you have ever had a dream and when you woke up, you wish it was real? I, mean, I think most of us, right? <laughs> no? Okay, I, I had, I've had many times that feeling like, oh, and then I have this strong feeling of longing, like, if only that world of the dream was really true. <laughs> when I was a teenager or a young man, it was maybe some, uh, someone I was infatuated with. And then I thought, oh, in the dream, we were together. And <laughs> but in reality, it's not true. But usually it was, actually more often it was somebody I, that I don't know that I've ever met before. But in the dream, I'm very infatuated with that person. <laughs> and somehow I, you know, I wake up and think, oh, yeah. if only that dream seems so, everything seems so perfect. Dreams seem so absent, um, or they, they are absent of uh, any difficulties sometimes. <laughs> So we only, you know, sometimes in the dream we can only bring up those aspects which are most pleasant. 
Okay, so this is a this is a relationship of mind consciousness to store consciousness. It has the capacity to mind consciousness is like the the screen. It's what's going on in our mind that we can be aware of right now. For example, you might be looking at my hand or or however I'm positioned in listening to my voice. That's what's going on in mind consciousness. But the sound is then going in and being archived right away in store consciousness. Maybe we can listen to a bell. So store consciousness is able to make habits. So this is crucial for our well-being because the way we live in everyday life, as we've learned in studying the four nutriments, that food coming into our sense impressions becomes our future. Through the present moment, we, we are feeding the future. There's a term for habit making. Um, basana. And it literally means perfuming. I think I spoke about this already in another of the classes last year. If you take jasmine flowers and you put them in a, in a tea container together with uh, tea leaves and you leave it for some time, when you then take the tea leaves out and you brew the tea, it has a fragrance of the jasmine flowers. I know in, uh, sometimes in Plum Village, some brothers love to um, practice the, the Vietnamese tradition of when uh, going out in a boat to the lotus flowers when they are in bloom and putting um, tea inside the flower. And then in the evening when the, the flower closes, then all night long the, the, the fragrance of the lotus flower perfumes the tea. And then you come back and you take the tea out and it has a lotus uh, perfume. So in the same way our environment, what we're receiving through our senses is perfuming uh, our, our body and mind, our, our nervous system. We are, um, and, 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 many, and most of that is going on unconsciously. We're not aware. It, it passes 
through mind consciousness, go straight into store. <laughs> the way we speak, our parents speak when we are young, it goes right in. We're not aware, we're not thinking consciously about the words they use. But it becomes uh, part of the database. And so when we find ourselves in, the sim in a similar situation, those same words come out. Words of anger, words of kindness, um, whatever. We have it all in our store consciousness. And then, uh, I don't know if you've had that feeling when you suddenly um, find yourself repeating what your father said, or your mom, and you suddenly realize, oh my gosh. <laughs> I am my father, I am my mother. I remember, for me, quite often, I, it happens when I'm, I'm doing work, like I'm in the workshop. We have a beautiful workshop here at Deer Park now, thanks to Nikolai. And so sometimes I'll be in there doing something and maybe it doesn't work out, and I notice my father, the, the words that he would say when he would be in the garage working on something, coming out. <laughs> and I see there's no more separate, there's no, I can't imagine any separation there is between my father and I is only imagination. <laughs> the reality is no separation. So this uh, perfuming is going on from the moment of conception. And even in the womb, we are <laughs> receiving from our mother and her body uh, impressions. And when we come out, we continue to receive it through our eyes ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So, it's very important what kind of environment we live in. We need to um, find an environment where we are nourishing seeds of joy, seeds of peace, seeds of happiness, and the people around us are, are practicing that as well, because that that kind speech, that joyful attitude, perfumes our own uh, store consciousness. And then in the future, we feel more joyful, more happy, more relaxed. And that is the whole basis, the foundation of the Plum Village approach to education. So here at Deer Park, we commit to living in the monastery. And we, we try to, if we use the internet or something, we try to do it together. And we, we keep it quite limited. If we, um, or if we're reading something as a monastic, we share with our mentor what we're reading so that we can understand what it is that is perfuming our consciousness. We may not be aware of the ways in which we are um, exposing ourselves to sense impressions and how they are watering our seeds of fear and despair and anger. So we, as a community, pay a lot of attention to the kind of environment we create in the monastery. That's why it's so pleasant to come here. You don't see you know, ads with very sexually attractive people. <laughs> you, 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 somehow our senses become more quiet when we talk to some people from outside, they think, oh, well, the monks and nuns, they are like sexually repressed. <laughs> but actually, when you remove yourself from the environment of this kind of barrage of images and videos and, and music, like when I, we go shopping here on, on, the, on the sound, these kind of sappy, romantic songs, and if you... If that, that's perfuming our consciousness. So when we feel a little bit not so well, then we, we, go, we grasp, we think, wow, if I only had a, felt that kind of passion that the singer feels in the song for that other person that they're in love with, that, I, that would get rid of my, my feeling of loneliness. So that's all going on. Advertisement, music, images, videos, and so forth. So here in Deer Park, we create the kind of environment where we don't need to be exposed to those things. We can walk around safely. 
and, and not see an advertisement or um, you know watch a movie or somebody's on t watching TV and the ads are coming up. We are free from that. We are very lucky. <laughs> Instead, we see sometimes deer, coyotes, the plants. We go on walking meditation and we see the chaparral. And so we, we are um, perfumed with, literally here at Deer Park, <laughs> with the fragrant plants in the valley, the sage and the uh, um, California, the, the Artemisia Californica, the California sagebrush and many, many different kinds of plants which literally perfume us, but also they touch this, uh, they perfume the seeds in our sore consciousness. So just like the, the tea in the lotus leaf, we have seeds in sore consciousness. And depending on our, the sense impressions, those seeds are perfumed by um, sorry, the seeds in our store consciousness are perfumed by the sense impressions which come in from our environment. So if we all have the seed of anger, but if we don't see disturbing or violent or unjust things, then that seed of anger can remain quite small. So in the monastery, we, we do sometimes read the news, but we read it with mindfulness because we are aware that, um, well, if it's in the news, it probably has an emotional aspect to it because many people care about it. That's why it's in the news. And it's a uh, novel. So we're attracted to novelty. So usually in that news story, there's something that can water easily the seed of anger. So we, if we, we need to be mindful while we expose ourselves to that news story, if we're not careful, then the seed of anger can become very strong and it can overwhelm us. And then we are very concerned about that issue Right now, in the United States of America, we are facing an unprecedented or a situation we haven't faced in, what, 40 years? More than 40 years, which is uh, young, young women not having access to abortion. And so there's a lot of anger. Whatever your, your point of view, <laughs> there, there's a lot of, it can touch a deep emotion when we talk about the government controlling the body, in this case, the body, women's bodies. So we have to be very careful if we want to be able to bring understanding and, and transformation in the situation. If we just let that, that if we just um, let that uh, uh, feeling of uh, pain or injustice just enters straight into store consciousness. It can water the seed of anger and we become like a bomb. <laughs> and we, we come in and we yell at our partner, we become you know, angry at our, uh, our, our child. So there are, there, are, there are things that are going on in the world which we, we may not agree with. And uh, we train ourselves to look deeply into our body and mind to try to understand. When, we, when something painful happens, something we cannot accept, we try to look into our, our heart and try to understand what are the causes and conditions that have brought about this situation. We open our heart with compassion and this, this takes a lot of patience and love because we want to understand not only the one who agrees with our point of view, but we want to open ourselves to understand the person who 
seems completely anathema to our way of looking at the world. How is it that they come to this understanding? Yeah, this is the practice of deep looking. So deep looking is not just, you know, just, just being aware of your breathing, but it's going deep. When we look deeply into store consciousness, we actually see that this, uh, <laughs> this kind of boundary here is not, uh, it's just a figment of our imagination. That what is going on in the collective is not separate from what's going on in the individual at the level of store consciousness. So this, this opens us up to a much, to a deeply transformed view of the world. This is the insight of interbeing. <laughs> we cannot be by ourselves alone. So what is going on in the individual store consciousness is intimately connected to what is going on in the collective store consciousness. And just because we feel we have an individual eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, we have the illusion of having an individual experience. But if we are able to step back to, to open our heart wider with understanding and compassion, we see that we are deeply connected at the level of store consciousness. Tai even talked about store consciousness being like the crust of the earth, <laughs> holding the seeds, holding the, the minerals, holding the plants, the animals, the living beings of millions, billions of years. And as things manifest due to causes and conditions, that is manifestation, uh, manifestation from the store consciousness of the, the crust of the earth, the atmosphere and crust of the earth. So this body is made up of earth, air, water, fire. To speak simply, to use the traditional elements, but now we know it's uh, <laughs> carbon and uh, H2O and <laughs> so forth. Um, and that body is all coming from the crust of the earth. This little, little with its thin, thin atmosphere. <laughs> On a clear night, sometimes I stand out and I look out at the stars. And you ever imagine yourself standing on this? You know, just the surface with this little thin atmosphere <laughs> looking out into this vast space with no oxygen, no, no, no uh, um, kind of gas to keep, keep things warm. <laughs> and I feel, wow, it can be a little bit scary to think that we're just standing here on the earth with such limited atmosphere. <laughs> a little kind of greenhouse on the surface of the earth. So, so when, when we hear painful news and we wonder how is it possible that people can think this way, see things this way, rather than just reacting and holding on to our point of view, I found that if I really want to transform my community, transform my own point of view, transform the point of view of society, I need to be, I need to look deeply. It's, it's not enough just to, yeah, to, to argue <laughs> or to grasp onto one point of view. We need to somehow do that deep work of opening our heart and going deep down to see that all these other points of view, they're also coming from a collective store consciousness. What, what our uh, neighbors, what our um, friends, 
are doing, the way that they are receiving sense impressions, the kind of environment that they are living in has, has watered the seed. And how can we understand that in order to, to ourselves bring about a healing? And that is a quality as well of the store consciousness to heal, to protect, nourish, heal, and continue life. Maybe we can listen to the sound of the bell. This is why uh, when you come to a monk or a nun and they are practicing well and you want them to confirm your, your belief, you come up to them and you ask, what is your stand? Or what, people ask us, what is the Plum Village stand on da 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 or this da da da, whatever. And instead you get uh, teaching on store consciousness and looking deeply. <laughs> We stand for understanding. <laughs> so it means we believe deeply in the world where people are practicing looking deeply to understand what is going on in the present moment. Because if we are in the kind of world where there are people who practice looking deeply and there are more people like that, that world is other, quite naturally peaceful harmonious, loving, caring. But we can, we can align our views perfectly with the dominant political narrative and still not be happy, peaceful, and harmonious. So that is why that is the priority, is understanding, looking deeply. Because we trust in the innate wisdom of each and every one of us. And our, our priority is to help one another to look deeply, to understand our mind. It would be very easy to just give you a, a, a fully baked point of view and just give it to you like a cookie and say, okay, this is what you have to believe. But that doesn't help you in your, your life as, as a human being, as a practitioner. So you may find many different points of view. If you talk to one monk, you get this one, you talk to another one, you get that one. You know, many people come to the monastery, it's very common. You come and then uh, you're, you're assigned to do this particular task, like compost. And that brother, that brother tells you to do it like that, and this other brother tells you to do the exact opposite. And then you come to another brother and you say, who am I supposed to follow? <laughs> and they'll say, look deeply. And see, you know, instead of telling you just that brother, that brother, it seems like all the monks and nuns, they should have only one way of doing the compost, right? Then everything would be organized very clearly. But the reality is not like that. That's not the reality of community. And that's not only true within a, you know, one community, but all communities. So it, opening up our point of view and trying to understand that where others are coming from who are ex in a kind of environment where this perfuming that goes on 
happens in a way which is not uh, not in accord with our point of view is is to nourish the seed of compassion so we have the seed of compassion and this is a very important seed I don't know that there, we can get too much compassion. <laughs> so if you have any moment free in your life, you can practice nourishing the seed of compassion. You can practice listening to someone who's suffering. You don't get carried away by their suffering and become angry. Watering the, and nourishing the seed of compassion means we, we listen in a way that we try to understand the suffering of the other person and embrace that suffering in order to help healing to take place. And we have that capacity innate. That's what this tenet is telling us. That's the beauty of this because store consciousness automatically functions to protect, to nourish, to heal, to continue life. We don't have to make any special effort. We just have to get all of our thinking and our perceptions out of the way <laughs> and allow our heart to open up just as we are trained to do in Dhamma sharing when we listen deeply to the other person. We, we you know, Tai says that it's our, our mind, our mind consciousness, um, when it is uh, full of prejudice, full of all kinds of thinking and perceptions, it's like we, it's like we have a big tarp covering the, the whole earth. And the rain that comes down, the sound, the person's voice, the experience of their suffering, it cannot penetrate. It just bounces back. <laughs> because of our, our habit of thinking, our, our perceptions. So with mindfulness and compassion, we can remove this, this piece, this plastic, this tarp that's covering the surface of the earth. And then the, the, the words of the other person go deep into store consciousness. They are there, and as we know, we let store consciousness do its work. It's, it's uh, millions of years that we have uh, evolved the capacity to be compassionate. It is one of the great qualities of Homo sapiens. We also have the capacity to be extremely violent and cruel, but we have incredible capacity to be compassionate. And the Buddha's insight is in how to train ourselves in such a way that we don't continue to perfume, per, to perfume, to make ha a habit of being violent, and instead cultivate compassion. And we do that by uh, putting ourselves in an environment where there are compassionate and understanding people, first of all. That helps us to see what kind of ways we can change our way of living, our daily life. For example, some in a place where people like in the monastery, where we wake up in the morning and we practice sitting meditation for 45 minutes. We don't have any sense impressions or very little coming in through our eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and our mind. We, we might have a lot going on <laughs> there, but at least these other senses are calm, right? We're not eating, we're not looking at the internet you know, on our device. When we look around, we just see other people doing sitting. <laughs> So that inspires us to continue sitting. I know, I find it so easy to come down and sit with the Sangha. But if I sit by myself in my room, I have to make more effort. Do you notice how easy it is? You just go with the flow of the Sangha, the river of the Sangha. You come up and you see every, all the monks and nuns flowing like a river into the meditation hall and you just go along with that flow. 
and then you sit, everyone else is sitting. You don't have to make any great effort. And that uh, is perfuming the seed of compassion in your heart. You may uh, be sitting next to a brother or a sister, and you know that brother or sister has had a lot of suffering lately. And by sitting quietly there, you don't even need to listen to the words they say. You're actually opening your heart and you, you sit for them. That person might not be there. It could be a family member. It could be on the other side of the planet. But you know the suffering they're experiencing. Before the sitting meditation session, oftentimes we will, uh, someone will have sent a, um, word about the situation of someone who's recently passed away or someone who's uh, very sick with cancer and undergoing surgery and we read that person's name and we send our energy so what does that mean when we send our energy it means that we are practicing to just let store consciousness do its work we we are aware of the situation of suffering of that person and we allow it to come in we hear the words and then we touch compassion because we may have known someone who is in a similar situation of having cancer and so we have images stored in the database of store consciousness which we can bring up and we imagine that person maybe we don't know who they are but it's not so important but we know that somewhere on this planet there's that person suffering or there's a family that is suffering the loss of their loved one and that is the, hearing that and allowing that to come in is already allowing the seed of compassion to grow in our heart and whether or not we see that we that that act of being compassionate in that moment is helping the family we know that that seed of compassion that we are perfuming that new habit we are making of opening our heart of understanding in the future when we hear another person suffering or when we ourselves are suffering we can give rise to compassion towards ourselves and help ourselves to heal we, we learn how to make good use of store consciousness. We don't make a huge effort. <laughs> this is why Tai told us over and over again that the practice can be very light and simple. Usually when we're trying to force ourselves to do it, it's not working properly. Our mind revolts. It's like a, it has a <laughs> tendency to revolt when we try to force it to do things. So this understanding of store consciousness helps us to change our behavior I, I wish it would this understanding could come out more in books I, now in the bookstore you have self-help books and you know, people want to make new atomic habits or whatever it might be that's great but it it, it you know it, we, we have to also understand our mind and now with neuroscience uh, as we learn having these uh, discussions and retreats with neuroscientists and those working in the realms of psychology and mind science as monks and nuns practitioners from a tradition of buddhist psychology we are learning that there are many insights from science that we can that are some of them challenge but most of them just confirm the experience of practitioners over many hundreds, uh, thousands of years who have been training their mind, the observations they have and how to change our habits that gives rise to this understanding which I'm presenting today. So the purpose of this presentation is not to, again, as I have often said, is not to try to describe reality. This is a functional model. It's a model to help us to understand our mind so we can transform it. It's not like we try to find the location of store consciousness in the brain, <laughs> right? 
This is, this is, this is a model for human beings <laughs> to understand their mind. So it's for the purpose of transformation and to stop forcing ourselves to put our energy where it's most useful, changing our environment, coming to a monastery or building a sangha where we live, where we can create the kind of environment where we can perfume the seeds and store consciousness with the kind of things that we want to cultivate. And then it it's doesn't have to be a big effort. Or if we can't build the Sangha, we come to a practice center. We change our lives because we see this is the priority. The most important thing I can do is to put myself in an environment where I cultivate the seed of compassion every day. But if we are in the monastery and we are wasting our time <laughs> with things that don't water the seed of compassion, we could be in the monastery surrounded by monks and nuns, but on our phone the whole time, worried about something somewhere some far away, and becoming angry, jealous, fearful, and so forth. So that is a challenge now of our time. You know, I'm very aware. I mean, I, I help with communication in our websites and our communities, and so I'm, I, I do <laughs> look at the Twitter account or late, the latest one's Instagram. I'm having to learn. <laughs> and it's, I can see, my goodness, it's very quick to get lost in all of this, the kind of impressions. I mean, fortunately, with the Deer Park Monastery and the Instagram, it's all people who are practicing mindfulness. So it's a lot about <laughs> reminding. If you if you are careful, you choose. You only have uh, friends who are practicing mindfulness, then everything you see is about mindfulness. <laughs> almost everything. Um, so, uh, but still, there are other things in there. Advertisements. People are vying for our attention. It's really the currency of the 21st century is our attention. So, um, so even in the monastery we have to practice to not get caught up in these things, to be able to put down the phone, put down the device, you know, shut off the computer and just enjoy our breathing. Because we know that's a reliable source of nourishment for our body and mind. So how does store consciousness help us to heal? Tai uses the example of our digestive system. When we eat, we, are, we, we may or may not be aware of our food that we're eating, but if we practice mindful eating, we're aware of the food, the taste that's coming in, the smell of the food, the taste on our tongue, the sensation in our mouth. And uh, we can practice to be aware of how the food feels going through our body. Sometimes we feel full, sometimes we feel hungry. There's other sensations in our gut. But most of the time, we, we, we do very little to contribute through mind consciousness to our digestive process. There's all kinds of things going on in our stomach. Our pancreas is releasing certain kinds of acids, depending on the food that we've eaten, our liver as well, helping to digest the food, move it, the peristaltic motion of food moving through our you know, small intestines and so forth. We're not thinking about any of that consciously. Maybe some of you, are, maybe someone is. I haven't been able to <laughs> affect very much the peristaltic motion through mind consciousness of my intestines. But all of that uh, movement and mixing of chemicals, proteins and so forth to help us digest the food. Uh, symbiotic uh, relationship with the biome, right, of different kinds of bacteria in our gut. This is all happening at the level of what we call store consciousness in this model of the mind. It is an autopilot. Our 
our heart beating. We're not. Imagine if you had to consciously think your heart to beat. <laughs> that wouldn't be a very safe situation. Fortunately, our heart beats without us having to consciously think about it. And uh, that is uh, the, the, that in, in this model would be the, f the functioning of store consciousness. These are all aspects in which the nervous system of our body is continuing to maintain our, to continue life, our heart beating, the digestive happening. Uh, digestion happening. These are ancestral functions of our body. But one of the qualities of Homo sapiens and many other mammals and other animals as well is that we have the capacity to learn. And so store consciousness does not only function on the autopilot, which is uh, contributed from our ancestral lineage, our evolutionary lineage. But it, we have the capacity through our sense organs and our mind consciousness to be able to learn and make new habits. So this is how mind consciousness um, helps Tai always reminded us, mind consciousness is very expensive. Store consciousness is very, um, has a low energy requisite. So it's always storing, archiving, organizing, but it does it in the background 24 hours a day. And, uh, but mind consciousness takes a lot of our energy to be mindful of our our eating, mindful of our breathing, or mindful of anything. It takes a lot of energy. Our brain consumes enormous amounts of glucose and oxygen to provide all the energy for us to, uh, to be conscious, to be aware of things. So, the beauty of organizing our environment in a way that it is nourishing these positive seeds in our consciousness is that it takes very little energy. So that's that tight insight. That's why he wanted uh, monks and nuns, for example, to study in the monastery, to not go to school outside. This was uh, quite controversial in Vietnam when Thay came back to Vietnam in 2005. He wanted to have at that time, already for quite a while, young uh, aspirants and monks and nuns um, in the monasteries, they would go out from the temple to the government schools and uh, study. When Thay was a young monk, he, he stayed mostly in the monastery as a young uh, aspirant. And then when he went to study, it was just down the road at the Buddhist Institute. And so Thay was only exposed to uh, to a very pure environment, very um, wholesome environment that watered the seeds of compassion and understanding. When he was bored, what did he do? He read the sutras, <laughs> or you know, he talked about the Dhamma with his Dhamma brothers. But uh, in two thousand five. And, and, not, and continuing now in, in Vietnam, monks and nuns will go out to the schools and there they're exposed to a lot of to drugs, sex, violence, many things that um, water the other kinds of seeds like craving, anger, fear in their consciousness. So when Thai set up Plum Village, he was very conscious of that and he wanted to create an environment where the learning takes place in the monastery. So even some of our, like for example, the abbot of Upper Hamlet, Taifa Pu, he first came to Plum Village when he was nine, I think. And then he went back to school in Canada, and then I think he came back at 12, and then became a monk at 13. So as a teenager, he was exposed to the monastery environment his whole teenage life. 
<laughs> eating mindfully, walking mindfully, learning to be tight attendant, uh, listening to Dhamma talks two, three times a week. So he doesn't have to make a huge amount of exertion to, to, <laughs> to water the seed of compassion because it, it's coming in, he's using the low energy uh, required by store consciousness to archive and uh, make new habits. And that is the wisdom of the whole Plum Village tradition, is to create environments where we don't have to make a huge amount of energy to practice mindfulness, because we are nourished by the brothers and sisters around us, the siblings that practice mindfulness around us. And so, you know, walking around and just, oh, why don't I be aware of my breathing? Why don't I be aware of my step? And because people around us are not rushing to get somewhere, they don't, uh, they're not full of anxiety and worry, we feel peaceful. And we, we borrow that peace, that, that uh, stability from our Dhamma brothers and sisters. And then it's very easy to be mindful of our breathing. But if we are in the kind of environment where people are full of anxiety and fear, rushing around trying to meet a deadline, to get money so they can pay for their car, pay for their house, pay for their kids' college education, then that is a seed. Those are the seeds that are watered in our consciousness. And uh, we have to make a big exertion to practice mindful eating or mindful breathing. We can go the whole day and not be aware of our breath in that kind of environment. So I always feel that as uh, monastics, we have, um, yeah, we have um, such a good situation. And as for, you know, multifold sangha, when we come and stay long term in a practice center, we are so fortunate, so rare to have this kind of environment that can water those positive seas in our consciousness 24 hours a day without very little effort. It's so, it, it's so um, uh, relaxing and easy somehow in that environment that we can sometimes take it for granted. And sometimes we, we need to actually be, sometimes the Sangha will ask us to leave the monastery <laughs> for a time so that we can really value, when we come back, we can value what is here, this good environment. And then we, we, we want to stick around because we are always in the process of making habits, wherever we are. And uh, so we have to be very aware we might think of ourselves as a mindfulness practitioner and participate in the Sangha, but for most of the hours of our daily life, we are getting fed anxiety, fear by our environment. So we need to learn to, we have to make the effort to shut off the television. <laughs> Maybe we can check the news once a week. That's good enough. I know, I, I, as a monk, I usually read the news every day, but I'm very aware that I'm surrounded by a very peaceful environment that is uh, contributing to my happiness. But I think if I were out in the world, I could not read the news every day <laughs> because that would be too much. There are too many other things that are coming in that are not uh, conducive to my happiness and well-being. So this understanding of the mind I find very helpful in changing my own habits. I still have a lot of, um, I still have seeds of anger, seeds of fear, anxiety, but it's much, much less than when I came into the monastery 20 years ago. And I know how to take care of the seed of anger and anxiety much better, even than I was, even than five years ago. And I'm, I can see that progress happening in my life as a practitioner. And that is thanks to this, this model. That's why I, I like to share about it all the time. And then Tai also like to share about it because it's how he learned to transform his suffering. You know, to really uh, uh, you know, understand the mind in a way that we can transform it. This is the point. 
We can study neuroscience, and that's helpful. But does that study allow us to change our habits? To understand what's the, the, the habitual way of functioning of our mind so in such a way that we can bring new habits in that bring more peace and harmony. That is why I find this model to be so helpful. And if we find a better model, wonderful. <laughs> we don't need to be attached to this one. That is the beauty of the Buddhist tradition. It's always growing and changing. So when we learn from fields like uh, P, uh, study of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or uh, trauma therapy, we can learn to understand deeper ways of transforming our suffering. We don't have to be closed-minded as Buddhists and only refer to a you know, Buddhist model. Even you know, the circle and everything, this is Thay's artistic way of depicting this, but we can do, we can learn new things. The important thing is that it it has to, we have to put it into practice and see the peace and happiness and joy that follows from it. Yeah. So we can learn and continue to grow, not only as Buddhists or mindfulness practitioners, but also as scientists and so forth. And, and we'll have a retreat on Buddhist psychology and science uh, in the end of August, beginning of September, to go more deeply into these topics and practice together as a community. Um, I deeply wish that we continue to this uh, interaction between Buddhism and science. So in Plum Village, they're doing it, uh, and now we start to do it here as well at Deer Park, and I think this is a very important movement. Um, to, to have a dialogue between science and Buddhism. They are both actually rooted in a very practical, lived experience, right? One observing in the lab what's happening, and the other in our very body and mind. <laughs> so, please, uh, I think I heard that there are only, already after a few days, there's only a few spots left in the Buddhist psychology retreat. All the rooms are filled. I think there's only camping left. So please sign up if you haven't already. It will be an in-person retreat, so you have to come here to Deer Park. <laughs> but we will go into understanding these, um, and these things like the perfuming of seeds in the habit-making of store consciousness. And uh, to finish, Mind consciousness is always developing ways for us to respond to situations, strategies to respond when the seed of anger comes up, the seed of fear, the situation happens in that, you know, in modern language you say it triggers a response. So, if we just continue to depend on store consciousness to respond to that situation, we will just behave the same way that we have in the past. So when a situation happens where someone says something or does something and the seed of anger comes up into mind consciousness, then we react and we blame, we, we judge, we to um, see the other person as the source of our suffering. And that is uh, the danger as well of this um, very practical function of store consciousness, which is to allow us to function on autopilot. So imagine that you had to learn to drive new every time. <laughs> You take away store consciousness and you, you have to get in the car. You don't know how the steering wheel works. You don't know how the, uh, well, in America, you, we mostly have automatic, right? But <laughs> in a manual car, you have the gear shifter, right? You don't know how to turn the key. 
Imagine looking with new eyes when you get in the car, if you didn't have store consciousness there. It's, it's not really possible to imagine. Thanks to store consciousness, we can get in the car, turn the key, and drive. And pe we, someone can be having a conversation with us, our eyes are on the road, and we can create a relatively safe environment of driving for ourselves and for the passengers. So the autopilot capacity of store consciousness is very good <laughs> for driving a car, <laughs> also for talking, because of all the seeds in store consciousness, I, I have a database of the sound of the English language, how to form my lips, how, to, how much air to expel, where to put my tongue, my teeth, all that. I'm not thinking of that consciously in the present moment. It's the autopilot capacity of store consciousness that allows me to speak in a, in a way that there's some comprehension, <laughs> right? But if we only depend, live on autopilot, it's like we are a zombie. We just respond according to the habit in our store consciousness. So that's where mind consciousness, mindfulness, is so essential. That is the, is the, create, uh, the creativity, the newness, being aware of the present moment, of new possibilities. Not just the dualistic, this way, that way, of, that we, we, we are of our habitual way of thinking, but we can find a new possibility. So whether it's a situation with uh, controlling a woman's body, uh, or the situation of gun, uh, young men shooting children in the school. These are um, seeds in our store consciousness of the collective body. And if we just continue to go on autopilot, it will not be enough to transform the situation. We need to look more deeply to bring up the seed of mindfulness as a collective. This is the, the Buddha of the future Tai talked about, the co collective awakening. When we come together, we generate mindfulness, we create a new possibility. And that can get to the root of this terrible suffering in society. We find a new way. We, 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 we might not know what it is right now. We, we may not be able to articulate it, but we continue to practice and we take trust in the eye of the Sangha. It means the, the collective vision of practitioners who are cultivating mindfulness. So the reason we are monks and nuns, we practice celibacy, <laughs> because sexual energy is very powerful, and if we direct it towards mindfulness, then all that powerful energy is directed to uh, being more aware of our body and our mind. And uh, a new possibility emerges. Okay, thank you for listening. We'll finish with three sounds of the bell. <laughs>